Hello, this is Kenny Werner doing a little bit of a lesson, a little bit of a promotion for my new book, first one out in 25 years, called Becoming the Instrument, Lessons on Self-Mastery from Music to Life. This is connected, I would say, to effortless mastery. But in all the years and all the experiences I've had, I found out that the lessons I learned in music, if they were verbalized correctly, they would be of help to people in any walks of life. So this book, in a sense, is a wider uh, way of talking about the same thing, but it can apply to anything. For example, the... Uh, Example of uh, effortless mastery, the definition of effortless mastery has uh, simplified over the years. Basically, effortless mastery is separating the body from the mind and separating the mind from the ego. So there's a performance implication there. So becoming the instrument. How does one become the instrument? The only instrument that really plays the instrument this is the instrument that plays the instrument, is my body. And you see it has an immediate effect on my mind. But it is the body that plays the instrument. And the reason the body can't function as easily and as efficiently is because it's always being tormented by the mind. I'm not playing good enough. I should have been playing better years ago. When am I going to ever learn this? All kinds of drama that doesn't exist in this moment. So playing the instrument without expectations would be playing it without the mind. Then again, the mind can stay. Another definition of effortless mastery is the mind plays, I mean, sorry, the body plays and the mind receives. Now, the mind can only receive if it's not uh, tormenting the body with priorities and consequences. Really, in most cases, there are no consequences to playing, only joy or sadness, whatever it takes, whatever it evokes in you. hearing harmonic development because I have taught this instrument, the body, to play harmony. Think about it. When the mind has to manage the body, by definition, it must be quite a bit of a level below when the body plays. Take rhythm, for example. If you have to be strong or awake or not have a cold or haven't eaten too much to be rhythmic, or if you would say, sometimes I'm more rhythmic and sometimes I'm less rhythmic, that is not as efficient and on the level of, of precision as someone whose body is rhythmic. That's why we find people are coming from rhythmic cultures to automatically be rhythmic when they play the music. But a lot of us Americans and Europeans, we have to implant rhythm that wasn't put there as a, chill, as a child. So there's a way to train the body to play rhythm, you know. But in order to train the body to be rhythmic, you have to get the mind out of the way. That's why separating the body from the mind, but you also have to separate the mind from the ego. The mind can watch, but it can't dictate. Because if it dictates, it's going to dictate impatience, it's going to dictate pessimism. It's going to dictate disappointment because you don't improve at the speed that the ego is demanding. And if you can't improve at the speed that the ego is demanding, you might miss the simple incremental improvement that you are making. So in order to do that, you need to stay out of the way mentally 
so that the body can feel what it plays, feels like to play rhythm, you know? say what tune that was but it was rhythm and I haven't touched the piano in a couple of days that's what the fingers do I literally spent decades uh, installing rhythm in a body that really didn't grow up in a rhythmic environment and it's the same thing for rhythm harmony and melody but the thing you really have to gain control over by letting it go is the mind because it's the mind that discourages. It's the mind that looks for false security. Like, how good do I play? That's supposed to pass for security. The truth is that a human being has a non-negotiable value just for being alive. And it should never be predicated on something as insignificant as how you play a musical instrument. Now, that might feel like splashing cold water in some people's faces, but the fact is music is not nearly as important as, say, your breathing. And you know that because if you stopped breathing, it wouldn't even take two minutes before you'd gladly give up music if you could just breathe again. Now, why would I denigrate the importance of music? Because what we discovered in my first book, Effortless Mastery, is that something that has been written about a lot in sports and in other psychology and psychology today and all kinds of articles and books, the fact is that when you try harder, you usually play worse. That when you think it's all on the line, most of us can't get it going the way we would normally have it going. And that if we were somehow tricked into not really thinking anything too important was going on, we could soar. But then it didn't matter because we were in a practice room by ourselves. So effortless mastery is the study of having that freedom at any time, not just accidentally. And becoming the instrument, I'll show it again. I don't know how I'm supposed to do this, so woo! I didn't want my face on the cover, but there it is. And lessons in self-mastery from music to life. If I was to guide anybody in their life, I would feel like an imposter. But... If I take the lessons I've learned in music, I feel absolutely on solid ground and worked with hundreds, if not, I don't know, over a thousand people now who had a shell between them and what they wanted. And the shell was the ego. And ironically, it was the ego desiring so much to play well. And it was that very thing that was standing in the way, not just playing well that day, but playing well uh, any day or practicing well. We don't practice well because we give up before we've achieved what we were practicing, don't we? And why do we do that? Because the ego embedded in the mind then talks to us with things like, oh man, you'll never learn this, or you should have learned this already, or I guess I'm not very talented, or, you know, I can recite all the things that many of us go through, and I've heard it, but I can almost read it when I see somebody in person. And the only thing you're doing wrong at that moment is listening to that thought. So the question is, how do you not listen to the thoughts that limit not just your music, but as I describe in this book, your life? Well, you have to get out of, I look at it this way, there's a couple of rooms. There's the conscious mind, and this is where all the details are. This is where all the drama is. This is where all the what ifs and because and consequences. You know, after all, we're talking about music, which basically has no consequences. You know, um, you can point out some situations where there would be consequences, but most of the time we're behaving as if there were consequences anytime. Even when we're sitting alone, what is that thing that's judging ourselves? It's us. Now, we've had a lot of help in learning how to judge ourselves, not the least being going to music school. However, the truth is the truth. And now it's time to learn to at least accept any sound.
coming out of you, and at most, loving it. The musical equivalent of enlightenment is this. Every note I play is the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. If you have brainwashed yourself to believe that, then you're on a golden highway. And all there is is rewards. Because it's not predicated on how good you play. And that's really important. Because whenever you've worried more about how good you play, you play worse. And whenever you don't care, you play better. So science, neurology, have really caught up with what the sadhus and the enlightened ones from thousands of years ago have talked about. And now it's about neuro neurology. So if you believe that I should only honor myself by touching an instrument, but you still judge yourself, that means you have a conscious philosophy, but you have not created a neurological pathway yet where that's familiar. You could believe that touching a piano is like dipping your hands in the warm water after making snowballs. But then as you approach the instrument, it might be more like touching a hot stove. And then you beat yourself up for that. Why don't I do, let's say in my case, what Kenny said? Because you have an older pathway that's much more worn in. You've walked it many times. I play good, I am good. I play bad, I am less valuable. I think if you ask anybody, even if they feel that way, they would not admit it. They would say, of course, that's a lie. Yet, many of us treat ourselves as if our value was uh, impacted by how good we play. So getting rid of that is not really getting rid of it, but it's like creating a new neurological pathway from what I call the space. If you've read Effortless Master, you know about the space. In Becoming the Instrument, I go a great deal more into the space and how you can do anything from there. It starts with self-generosity, meaning whether I do it right or not, I'm still going to feel good about myself. Paradoxically or ironically, you have a much better chance of doing it well. So these are the lessons from Becoming the Instrument that I hope you'll like to check out. I think they especially still resonate with artists, but now I believe it resonates with anybody, businessmen, definitely athletes, um, just people trying to appreciate their life instead of wishing it was something else. And the whole time I'm talking to you, neurologically, my left hand is playing. So the question is, while I'm talking to you, Who's playing? Is it God? Jesus? Charlie Parker? A little bebop there. Is it Bruno Mars? Is it purely neurology? Or is it the 11th step? The 11th percent of the brain? Who knows? Who cares? You just want to believe, and you have to build that belief through practice, which is outlined very well in the new book and the old book. How do you believe that any note I play is exactly the right note? And why is it the right note? Because I played it. Works a little differently for classical players. Classical players have to learn the notes so deeply that the piece plays itself then the mind can watch once the mind has been relieved from the tyranny of the ego. And how do you do that? Well, I'm going to end with this. Instead of thinking what you're thinking, move into another room, and in that room is the space. And in that room, you just watch the breath. Don't even think of it as spiritual. Think of it as this instrument is a machine. And within it is another machine, many machines actually. And this machine breathes. And although this is the most important source of your life, you never think about it.
But if we take a half a minute and just watch it, we'll find we're in the space. Go. No rituals, no costumes. You watch yourself breathe, and if you totally watch yourself breathe, the blessing is you're not thinking. And from there, and stop. From there, you start to play. And even though your hands are playing, neurologically, they can do that. Just like they use a fork and you could be on the phone with your accountant. Why does the fork still hit your mouth? Because neurologically, the hands can play without being constantly managed by the ego or the mind or the mind that's managed by the ego. So you practice, the hands play whatever instrument the mind watches, but it focuses its attention on the breath. to the breath. There's a lot more to say, and it's all in becoming the instrument. Whether you play, you play golf, you play tennis, or you want to just feel self-generosity or gratitude, which comes a lot easier from the space than it does from the conscious mind. So now it's about, is it gratitude that I can play or disappointment in the way I play? Is it gratitude for my life or constant expectations that ruin my life? Or they certainly dim the light of my life. to the space, watch yourself breathe for a few seconds, totally, and you'll find your mind moving away from the thoughts and into the space and into the moment. And then from there, start practicing. Introduce your mind to the perfect version of who you are. And that's you without the expectations, you without the thoughts. It took me a long time to find it in my life, but I think I found it. But in music, it's always been pretty easy. No matter what I play, that's the most beautiful sound I ever heard. Thank you for listening. <laughs>